We've now seen how the law of one price in the form of purchasing power parity affects exchange rates through trading in output markets. The exchange rate for the dollar in terms of euros, for example, is driven by purchasing power parity to the price level in Europe divided by the price level in the US. And we can similarly write the exchange rate for euros in terms of dollars as the inverse of this, the price level in the US divided by the price level in Europe. Now, as soon as we have those two equations, we can see what purchasing power parity predicts for the impact of inflation on exchange rates. Inflation is just an increase in the general price level. So if we see inflation in the US, but not in Europe, we would see an increase in the price level of the US. That increase in the US price level will cause a decrease in the exchange rate for the dollar, a depreciation of the dollar. While that same increase in the price level in the US will cause an increase in the exchange rate for the euro, an appreciation of the euro. Or if we see inflation in Europe, but not in the US, we'd see an increase in the price level of Europe, causing an appreciation of the dollar, and that same increase in the price level of Europe, causing a depreciation of the euro. So one of the implications of purchasing power parity is that inflation in a country will cause that country's currency to depreciate. It'll lead to a depreciation of the currency. Now one of the problems with purchasing power parity is that it relies on trading in output markets. And trading in output markets doesn't change instantaneously. It takes time to change trading patterns, to change supply chains, and so forth. So if conditions change and purchasing power parity predicts that certain things will happen to exchange rates, that may take a while if it works its way through these output markets. So short-run fluctuations in exchange rates probably don't happen because of purchasing power parity working through these output markets. Short-run exchange rates, exchange rate fluctuations must come from somewhere else. And the place they come from is the one remaining place that we haven't filled out in the circle of flow diagram. The rest of the world doesn't just interact with us through our output markets, it also interacts with us through our financial markets. So the rest of the world might, for example, lend money to the US. When that happens, dollars flow into US financial markets. Or people in the rest of the world might buy US financial assets, and again that will cause dollars to flow into US financial markets. On the other hand, the US might lend money to the rest of the world, in which case those dollars will flow in the other direction. Or the US might buy financial assets in the rest of the world, causing dollars to flow in that direction. Now, thing, the thing about what happens on this side of the circular flow diagram is that it can happen very quickly. It doesn't rely on changing trading patterns or forming new supply chains in the goods market. Changing your financial investments can happen at the push of a button. And the law of one price that has to hold in the long run on this side of the circular flow diagram, therefore has to hold in the short run on this side of the circular flow diagram. So what does the law of one price imply on this side of the circular flow diagram? Well, it implies that the rates of return on similar assets have to be equal across countries in the short run. So if you look at the real interest rate in the US and compare it to the real interest rate in Europe, the law of one price implies that those should be equal. If they weren't, if the real interest rate in the US were higher than in Europe, then if you're holding European bonds, you would want to sell those bonds and buy US bonds that have a higher rate of return. So arbitrage leads to an equalization of the real rate of interest across countries. And again, that can happen very quickly because financial transactions can happen very quickly. Now suppose that we are in fact in equilibrium and the real rate of interest is the same across the US and Europe. And now something changes, and the U.S. real interest rate increases. What's that going to mean? 
Well, that means if you're holding a bond in Europe, you might want to sell that bond and buy the U.S. bond that has a higher rate of return. But in order to buy that U.S. bond, you have to first buy dollars. Because the only way to buy a U.S. bond is to buy it in dollars. So we can now look at the market for U.S. dollars. The price for U.S. dollars is the exchange rate of the dollar. And so we'll have a demand curve and a supply curve. If the real interest rate in the U.S. increases, then we're going to see European bondholders wanting to switch to U.S. bonds. So they'll sell the European bonds and then buy U.S. dollars to buy the U.S. bonds. And that's going to increase the demand for U.S. dollars. As you increase the demand for U.S. dollars, the exchange rate for the U.S. dollar will increase the dollar will appreciate because of the new demand for U.S. dollars. We can also see what happens in the market for euros. If we put euros on this axis and the price of euros, which is the exchange rate of the euro, on this axis, we can have a demand curve and a supply curve. When the U.S. real interest rate increases, European bondholders want to switch to U.S. bonds. So they have to buy U.S. dollars, which means they have to sell euros. As they sell euros, we see a decrease in the demand for euros. And that's going to cause a decrease in the exchange rate for euros, a depreciation of the euro. If the exchange rate, I mean, if the real interest rate in the U.S. fell instead, we would see the opposite. People in the U.S. would want to buy bonds in Europe where the rate of return is higher. To buy those bonds, they would have to buy euros, and that would increase the demand for euros. That would increase the exchange rate for euros, causing an appreciation of the euro. And as these people are selling their bonds and buying euros in order to buy European bonds, they're also selling dollars which leads to a decrease in demand for dollars and a decrease in the exchange rate for the dollar. The dollar is depreciating. So the law of one price implies that real rates of return across countries have to equalize, and that can happen quickly because of how quickly we can make financial transactions on this side of the circular flow diagram. That means that short-run fluctuations in exchange rates are driven primarily by what happens in financial markets, whereas the long-run exchange rate is anchored by purchasing power parity in output markets in the ways that we've discussed before.